So, for those of you who read the FT over the weekend, you may have noticed an article in which a certain Professor Ricardo Rebonato from EDHEC Risk Climate Institute said, climate scenarios without probabilities are impossible to integrate into risk management. So, that being one of the many topics that we're going to be delving into over the next hour in this panel. So the panel is essentially on the Climate Biannual Exploratory Scenario Learning Exercise, commonly known as CBES. And uh, that exercise was designed to stress test the UK's largest banks and insurers' portfolios against climate risks. So what we're going to be doing is exploring the findings and learnings from this exercise. And we'll be having a, a discussion with the panel here, who I'll introduce in a second, around scenario planning and the challenges and the future of climate stress testing. Just a quick word about who I am, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mike Wilkins. I'm a professor at Sustainable Finance at Imperial College London, but I'm also one of the co-leads at the CGFI, so, and also involved in the CBEARS learning exercise together with uh, Nicola Ranger and also Professor Ian Clacker. Now, Nicola Ranger unfortunately can't make it today, uh, but in the interests of diversity, we've asked Ian to, uh, to join and uh, take her place. Now, you might think, what, what, diversity in what sense? Well, he's got a beard, so that's about as good as we can get, I'm afraid. Um, so apologies for that. Not for his beard, of course, but uh, for Nicola not being here. But uh, we eagerly anticipate and await what Ian's going to tell us. He's going to talk to us about the findings from the CBEARS learning exercise and also um, talk us through the key recommendations that came out of that. So uh, before I uh, ask, actually, I'll introduce the panel later. I'll let Ian get going and then I'll introduce the panel. So Ian, please, over to you. So, as Mike very clearly pointed out, I'm not Nicola, and that then comes with some massive caveats, because I found out I was doing this at midnight last night or this morning, depending on how you do time. So, I'm actually not just Prodean International, I'm also a Professor of Pensions and Finance, so I'm not some random bit of the academic machinery coming to do this, and I was also involved in the CBES exercise and doing the research. So. I think what we want to get to is a reasonably quick overview of what we did because I think the more important bits, the more interesting bits are the what next that come from this. So when I got the slides, it was also quite a surprise to see myself. That is, that is myself, Nicola, Mike and people at Imperial doing a round table with some of the participants through the Climate Financial Risk Forum. And one of the things that's important about that is and I was just discussing this with Chris. Um, what I found very interesting in this piece of research is working with the Bank of England, because the Bank of England is, as a central bank, very cautious, and that because it has such a fundamental role. And so the CBES exercise in being able to get this level of access and this freedom to actually investigate what worked, what didn't, is actually, I don't think, very common in working with central banks globally. So I think it speaks to something about the approach taken by the bank and more broadly in the UK, because we see other examples of this within the FCA and so on. So what we're looking at is, this is like a proper partnership, and this is, to some extent, an unfiltered exercise. So we sense check things with people in the Climate Financial Risk Forum, we sense check things with the bank, but actually this is a wholly independent piece of work, and so the views expressed here are our own. That's further caveated with the fact that anything I say between now and the end of this session are just my views, they're not Nicholas, they're not CGFIs, just in case I get it wrong. Right, so very quickly, the objectives of the CBES exercise help strengthen knowledge and capability across the UK and globally because actually the CBES exercise was a sort of paradigm shift in terms of how central banks do things. So any learning that comes from the CBES exercise can be shared globally. We wanted to understand what the impact CBES had on the capability of those that participated and we also wanted to come up with some recommendations which I think will be the, the general subject for the next 
panel discussion. So very quickly, started in March, April uh, 2022, made some informal interviews. We then built and developed a survey and that was where it's interesting from a research sense because you're bringing together climate scientists, you're bringing together social scientists and various other groups to try and make this work because you're dealing with something which cannot be analysed through one lens or by one discipline. We then ran the survey and actually, despite those small numbers, that's actually a really high number given how few institutions participated. So actually this is really quite strong evidence and also it's what we call in social sciences hard to reach populations. The people that we got access to are the people who are doing this. That's very, very rare to be able to do something like that. We then also had some uh, formal interviews with banks, general insurers and life insurers. There was a two workshops in January and the report was then released later, uh, earlier this year. So in terms of highlights, I think the strong evidence for capacity building was there. And so we feel that the CBES exercise was hugely positive in this way. And particularly because what happened was a much greater awareness at board and sea level. Okay, so the top end of these organisations started to become much more cognizant and aware of these types of risks. And that's the only place you're going to get traction. If we want to see systemic change in any of these institutions, it has to get that high. And the CBES exercise, for me, delivered it. Now, one of the things we also found was the lower, the lower impacts at the client-facing client level. And that's really about the fact that the process was fairly short and a lot of those direct engagement with clients didn't take place. That wasn't something which was an objective of CBES, but it was one of the findings that we had. Okay. Broadly speaking, the design was seen as adequate for the purpose of it. Okay. Now, there were challenges, and we'll come back on to the static balance sheet because it's in the recommendations. But what we're looking at is, as an exercise it worked, but things like the static balance sheet, which are controversial, and I know Mike has discussed this in many forums as well, um, it had a use because we could do something with it. It was not perfect, and I think the bank acknowledges that. And what the CBES exercise also did, and it was one of its objectives, is it allowed us to learn lessons for future work. So actually what worked in this exercise and what was good, and then what didn't, what needs to change going forward, okay? And one of the things that again comes from the exercise is there was this capacity building within the sector more generally because nobody had ever done anything like this before. It was done in a fairly constrained period when other things were going on. But what we did see is there was this upswell in organisational capacity and personally, I think we have to maintain that in some way. How we do that, I think, is an open question, but it would be a tragedy to see the capacity that has been built up lost. Okay, and as I said, the findings can be shared. So the lessons from the CBES exercise do not just apply to the Bank of England in the UK, they can be shared globally and help other central banks and supervisors around the world frame their exercises more carefully to build off of this. So for our recommendations, I think the one that I'd like to focus on, because it's the one that will always come up, is addressing data gaps. Okay, there are always going to be data gaps. And one of the big challenges we have is with data gaps, what do we do? Do we do nothing just now and hang about and wait until we fill those gaps? Or do we proceed with an imperfect analysis to make progress? And for me, I think the approach of an imperfect analysis to make progress, which is where we arrived at, allows us to identify those data gaps. And I think some of those gaps, it speaks to the previous panel about transition plans. And so actually some of those data gaps are already getting filled. And so as we bring this together, what we're going to be able to really do is accelerate these types of exercises going forward. The other thing that is going to be really important is this kind of collaboration in terms of methodologies, guidance, knowledge models, scenarios, the whole thing. Because what is a real risk, and we've seen it in other places around other things, is that everybody starts to veer off in different directions and well-intentioned as they are, that non-standardisation, that n a lack of commonality means that we're going to potentially miss things. And so I think very, very importantly, if we look at things like dynamic balance sheets, that's an extremely hard thing to do. It's something that emerges as something that has to be done in response to CBES. But 
it's extremely challenging. And so I think as we forward look that, we have to be honest about what the direction of travel is and how we get there. We also can look to things like the Climate Financial Risk Forum as a way of convening relevant actors in this space to try and get those standards, that commonality, and learn from each other because it's the way in which we'll accelerate forward. But now, last thing, sorry, I just looked down and it said 33 of 76, which panicked me. I've only got seven slides. Um, <laughs> Very, very quickly, just to finish before we get into the discussion, I've got to say thank yous, okay? So I've got to thank the whole team of researchers because while myself, Nicola and Hannah, who's loitering somewhere in the audience, led on a lot of this, that just gives you an idea of the amount of people that are involved from the CGFI side. We've also got to thank the Climate Financial Risk Forum for all the support and access they gave us, and also uh, GARP, and also to Chris at the bank, because as I said right at the start, I am not aware of the bank previously being so open in the way in which it engaged with a group of academics because as you can see we are quite random. Now, as I said, this is my views, this is not Nicola's or CGFI's. Anyway, if you want more information, there's Nicola's details. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. Um, so we'll, we'll get into our discussion now. And to avoid the um, death by panel syndrome, uh, I'm going to try and keep this fairly light and breezy uh, in terms of a conversational style. So but quickly to introduce the panel in front of you from, my, from your left to right, uh, we have uh, Professor Rama Khant from the uh, uh, Mathematical Institute of Finance at University of Oxford. Um, Joe Paisley, who's uh, president of the Global Risk Institute at GARP. Uh, Jacob Tomai, who is from Two Degrees Investing Institute, uh, and uh, we have uh, Chris Faint, uh, who's a leader of the Climate Hub at the Bank of England, and Ian, you already know. So that's the, the panel we have uh, this afternoon. So let me go uh, straight to, for the jugular, so to speak, and I'll address this uh, to Joe to get things going. Um, was or is sea bears fit for purpose? Good question. Um... And I would say, yes, it was fit for purpose because the purpose uh, was really about building capability and let's not forget it's kind of world leading. So there wasn't a blueprint out there to just follow. Um, <clears throat> now, one thing I've noticed already is people were slipping into talking about it being a stress test and it, it wasn't a stress test. It wasn't designed to be a stress test. So uh, when we're talking about scenario analysis and stress testing, we need to think about what is the purpose um, that we're doing this exercise for. And I see the seabirds very much as a kind of world first, building capability in the firms, uh, which wasn't there. Uh, so for those of you who don't know GARP, we're the Global Association of Risk Professionals, and we are passionate about risk education. Now, I run the Thought Leadership Arm, which was set up five years ago, and was given a kind of blank canvas, look at any areas of risk that you don't feel that risk management is paying enough attention to. And practically the whole five years I've been focused on climate risk, sustainability, nature, increasingly nature, which gives you an indication of kind of how important it is, how systemic it is, uh, but also the gaps we see in terms of knowledge, capability, understanding, uh, which need to be urgently addressed. And I think that's what the Bank of England was doing, uh, but I can't really put words into Chris's mouth. Uh, but in terms of being yeah. fit for, per for that purpose, absolutely. Now we can argue about you know, other purposes, yeah. like was it really stressful? Was the design of the scenario appropriate? How do we move on? And I'm sure we'll come, we'll to come that. back to that, yeah. Jacob, what's your view? Was it fit for purpose? So, um... I have to agree on the first bit, but then the question is, is that an appropriate enough purpose, right? So it is worth interrogating whether simply saying capacity building and, mm. and you know, education and the comments that Ian made as well, is that the right level of ambition for an exercise like that? And I think you know, we've talked about sort of the conservative nature of central banks already mm. and some of the constraints or handcuffs that perceived or otherwise are put on these exercises as a result of that. But there is just, I think, a lack of courage in actually moving away, in making sure that the kind of economic risks are properly translated into financial risks. 
the IPCC is 3,000 pages long, right, plus. So nobody reads this, I guess. But the chapter on economic risk in the IPCC are about six to 10 pages out of 3,000 pages. And they tell you that there are quite a large number of scenarios suggest the UK will economically benefit from climate change under most temperature outcomes. This is the IPCC. So if the central bank wants to exercise, wants to implement a risk exercise, whether you want to call it stress test or not, we can debate the semantics, they have to have the courage to challenge the true risks that may materialize. And that requires looking at the mortality effect of climate change. That requires looking at the potential conflict and civil and international conflict effects of climate change. That requires looking at massive supply chain disruption from climate change. And if you're unwilling to do that, then at least on the physical risk side of the exercise, you may be wasting your time. Mm. Chris, <laughs> I don't expect you to be able to say anything in an unbiased way, but um, <laughs> if you can, give us your view um, on whether you felt CBEZ was fit for purpose, bearing in mind its limitations, shall we say? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And yeah, yeah I, I, I probably am a bit biased since, <laughs> I, since I designed it and implemented yeah. it. So, so um, let, I, I, I want to pick up this point on, on ambition, because I think, I think with hindsight, it might be easier to, to frame ambition compared to where we were. So in 2019, when we announced that we we're going to do the CBEZ, no framework existed in the world for doing this. So we started with a blank piece of paper, we locked ourselves in a room, and over a couple of months, we actually looked at how to do these exercises. And that was a huge exercise in itself. And we didn't only think about how we can stress test the banks, which is what we've done in the past, but for the first time ever, we looked at um, doing an exercise of a scenario, a scenario exercise, not a stress test, um, that included both banks and insurers. So that's huge. That is the first time all of those institutions have been put in an exercise together because we didn't want to be unambitious. If you just looked at banks, you would only get part of the picture. We also looked at further ambition. We could have looked at including asset managers, pension funds, but there's capacity in what you can do. And this is the story of the CBEZ. Um, in every aspect of the CBEZ design, we could have been more ambitious. We could have included the trading book. We could have looked at more granular data from institutions. But if you go too, amb if, if you look, if you go too ambitious, then the issue is that I think the quality of what you do get goes down. There's only so much capacity within institutions to do new stuff. So what we sought to do was balance ambition for something that's never been done before with reality of what we could actually get back. And I think what we sought to do was get a sweet spot. Now, in some ways, I think, I think we got that right. I think it was absolutely right to include banks and insurers, but maybe not include asset managers and pension funds at, the moment, at that time, because it would have just been too big. Similarly, I think it was right to not include the trading book. I think that would be a totally different framework for doing an exercise. We can get onto frameworks if that's helpful. So I think that was also the right decision. Yeah. Now, could we have gone more stressful? Potentially. Could we have included some um, different kind of narratives around the CBES? Absolutely, which is, so it goes to the value of what, you, what you've, you've found from your, from your exercise. So I would argue we were ambitious. I would definitely state that we would do the exercise differently if we were to do it again today. But that was the point of doing the exercise in the first place, doing a world first exercise so we could understand what works and what doesn't, and then just be open about the fact that if we yeah. do it again, we're going to do it differently. Sure. I mean, and that's one of the learnings from the exercise is what could be done differently. Um, maybe if I can come to you, Rama, and, you know, I know you've, you've looked at it from a mathematical modelling perspective. What do you think could be done differently or what could be improved on for future scenario exercises like CBES? Thank you. So first, let me start by commending Chris and his team at yeah. the Bank of England for actually doing this because I've been involved in regulatory exercises elsewhere and actually carrying out such an ambitious uh, project is yeah. very difficult. So uh, that's already commendable that they have done something. Now, from the point of view of the methodology, there are many things that can be improved. So one of the things that Joe said initially is that I don't think this uh, CBES should be seen as a stress test, even though some people may have intended it as such, because um, the way, uh, well, if you look at how stress testing is done in, in the banking sector, for example, there are actually two different uh, uh, ways stress testing is done. One is supervisory stress testing, which is probably the one that the Bank of England built upon to design this exercise. Mm -hmm. 
There, the regulator the, picks one or two scenarios, an adverse scenario and a baseline scenario, and then they compare the banks or the uh, insurance mm. companies' losses in these scenarios, and that's the goal. Here, the choice of the scenario is crucial because it should somehow embody the risks that the uh, institutions face in an extreme but plausible uh, situation. So this, this choice of the scenario is crucial. And in a banking or a, in a bank stress test setting, often there is a dominant market factor, whether mm -hmm. index or interest rate. So the scenarios correspond to large adverse moves of this dominant risk factor. Mm -hmm. So in, uh, but then there is the internal risk management of the banks and financial institutions where stress testing and risk management is done in a more, much more complex way. Uh, institutions typically look at a range of scenarios and the reason is that given the complexity of the portfolios it is not obvious at all ab initio where the risk lies so you look at actually a very large range of scenarios tens of thousands mm -hmm. and you try to assess the exposure of the financial institution to these scenarios and then identify as an outcome not as an input the scenarios to which the financial institution has the largest exposures and then you may want to hedge that risk or take that risk, that's another decision. So we have a range of scenarios, very large number versus the choice of a single scenario in the supervisory stress test. Obviously banks do not rely on supervisory stress tests for their risk management policies. That would be highly risky to base your risk management on exposure to a single scenario. No, nobody does that. So this is a reporting thing, really, and financial institutions really have an internal risk management based on a very wide range of scenarios. Now, coming to this exercise, we're looking at climate change, very, very complex phenomena in which a multitude of factors intervene. So having a single scenario means you're picking one single pathway for all the complexity of factors which enter this problem including demographic, physical, and also financial, economic, that's uh, certainly, if, uh, if you know in advance where your risk lies, perfect, but that's highly unlikely. It's even much more complex than a purely financial portfolio. So here, I think it's even more, nece I mean, it's even more necessary to look at a range of scenarios, probably wider than what we do when we look, say, at the fixed income portfolio. So, and now if we go to the details, the CBES, um, scenarios, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, were based on one, uh, one of the so-called uh, shared socioeconomic pathway scenarios that were uh, um, an output of the climate science uh, um, and I IPCC work. This is the, the one, there, so they produce five scenarios, uh, shared, uh, the so-called shared socioeconomic pathways, one to five. Uh, depending on whether you think uh, there will be an active engagement in favor of transition or not. And the, this, I, my understanding is that CBES was based on SSP2, the second scenario, so, which is a middle of the road scenario. There is some engagement for transition, but not full. Mm -hmm. So it's a, if you want, it's a middle of the road scenario, as they call it. It's certainly not an extreme scenario. So even in the framework of the five scenarios of uh, the SSP scenarios, we're not looking at a stress test in the sense that we're excluding the extreme scenarios. And even the SSP scenarios, whether the uh, extreme ones or one and five or the middle ones, you should think of them, if you're a financial institution, you should really think of them as a way to center the scenario universe you're thinking of. It mm. defines the expected evolution of a certain number of macro variables. And then around those variables, you will have volatility. Somebody pointed out this in the previous uh, panel. The, and the volatility would build around these scenarios to generate actual market scenarios, which would, would be then an input to your stress test. And I think that's, for example, how if we look at the uh, uh, bank stress test scenarios, that's really how it's done also. You have a macro scenario for defined in terms of inflation and GDP and so on. And then the financial institutions base themselves around that to generate scenarios for market variables. Mm -hmm. So there's volatility incorporated at the second stage. And here I think we should really think of the CBS scenarios as a baseline around which there will be other uh, things coming on, the okay. specific factors related to market body. So this is a, about the scenarios. My second remark is um, something that came up in the, in the GARP survey, 
it's about what's called static balance sheets versus dynamic balance sheets. So these scenarios in CBES are long-term scenarios. We're not talking about three months, but rather you know, decades. Mm -hmm. So over decades, uh, it is unrealistic, of course, to assume that any financial institution's balance sheet will be static. There will be uh, rebalancing uh, at least at the annual level, and uh, the balance sheet 10 years from now may look completely different. So the input to these exercises, unlike bank stress tests, which are short term, uh, there you can, you know, the, the inputs are typically the static balance sheets as observed today, as a certain date, uh, observation date, here it cannot be balance sheets because balance sheets change over time and 30 years, even 10 years is a very long time scale for balance sheets. So as was indicated in the previous uh, panel, the input should be strategies. Describe your business plan, your strategy to face, uh, your transition plan, your uh, strategy for climate change. And I will then tell you whether your transition plan will survive such and such scenario. So uh, transition plan is dynamic, is a, is a commitment to do certain actions which will then affect the portfolio in, in a certain way. If I can then implement that in the, in the, uh, in the scenario analysis, that's going to give me a more uh, reliable answer than how does your current static balance sheet grow through the scenario? Because right. that may not correspond to any actual profit and loss of the financial institution unless they're slipping at the wheel, hopefully not. So those are my two remarks. So I think the static balance sheet is not a technical issue. It's somewhere in the, in the documents. It, uh, but it's really, uh, we need to think about strategies, uh, scenario analysis of strategies just as financial institutions today uh, do backtesting of their mm. investment strategies, they don't uh, backtest static portfolios. They say, okay, this is my investment strategy. I'm going to do a bad backtest of this or to, through counterfactual scenarios. They know how to do that, but you, you, have to, uh, uh, you have to incorporate the strategy as deployed over time, especially if we're looking at such a long yeah. horizon. Okay. Yeah, maybe just to pick up on the usefulness of this from, from a risk management perspective, I mean, d despite the, the limitations that have been highlighted in this exercise, there are still certain aspects of it which can be useful um, but need to be adapted going forward. And maybe, Joe, could you um, just give us your view on that? What, what do you think going forward could, could change to make the CBEARS that much more useful for risk management professionals? Well, there's, CBEARS is kind of gone, so right. it's, you know, unless you're going to do another CBEARS, but, yeah. um, you know, the question is, uh, you know, how can banks and other financial institutions model the risks that they are exposed to, understand them, mitigate them, um, and help the transition? Uh, yeah. So. So one, one thing that, that might be quite interesting is that uh, before the CBEARS actually started, we set up a little working group with many of the banks that were involved. And uh, it's interesting that we're critiquing the CBEARS now because I know that that group, you know, before they even knew what the templates were going to be on the instructions or anything, literally did not have a clue what they were going to do. Uh, so it's a kind of mark of success, isn't it, that we're here critiquing the fact that we shouldn't be using necessarily SSP2 uh, as underpinning. You know, we, we've, we've come on an enormous, enormous way. But one of the exercises we did with the banks was just a very simple exercise to uh, benchmark their probabilities of default. Because one of the problems with the climate <coughs> modelling is you haven't necessarily got the historical back data to kind of look, well, you know, with a, with a macroeconomic scenario, you look at what happened in the financial crash that happened in the, uh, 2007 or whatever, and you can benchmark yourself against that. Yeah. With climate, it's not the same. You don't necessarily have that back data. So what do you do when you model something that's quite new, you present it to your senior management, and you go, okay, do you think this is reasonable? And they go, well, I, don't, I have no idea if this is reasonable, literally no idea. So one way you can overcome the lack of time series is you can kind of go for a cross-section. So what we did, we did some benchmarking. We got the firms to submit to us their, how their PDs evolved in the disorderly scenario that the Bank of England uh, uh, published. 
And my goodness, that was illuminating um, because there was such a range. Now, what we did, we, we split it down by credit uh, ratings for different sectors. I mean, it's a pretty broad brush thing. It's not an exact science. But the learnings they got, it was just to see sort of, you know, were they a million miles from the center of the distribution? Uh, and if they were, why was it? Was it because they were just ridiculously prudent or, or the others were, were not prudent enough? And so that kind of learning mm. exercise was huge. Mm. Now, what comes mm. after CBEZ? Well, to be honest, kind of more exercises like that, but critically more short-term scenarios as well. Mm. One of the things that the banks really struggle with is kind of trying to think 30, 50 years ahead you know, if you want them to take action now, risk management action, then it sort of has to be within the next five years, really. And that is the huge challenge, isn't it? Because we don't expect many of the, the physical risks to become kind of extreme until beyond that, which of course depends on the action they take today. Yeah. So, and it's also contingent on policy. So I think we're going to have to have more short-term scenarios. We're going to probably going to have to have more regulatory scenarios based on a range of different SSPs. Um, but we're absolutely going to have to see um, not just better scenarios, but also better modelling uh, within the banks as well, better, more expertise, more benchmarks that they can use. Because this is not just about the biggest and most sophisticated banks and insurance companies, it's also about all of the other, all of the other firms as well that are smaller and arguably probably more concentrated, more exposed, uh, because the, the bigger firms can probably yeah. be a bit more geographically um, uh, diversified. So, yeah, shorter term scenarios, more integration within their risk management, better modelling, better exercises like the benchmarking one I was talking about so mm. they can learn from one another as well. And no doubt, CBEZ 2.0, which will be even better and incorporate mm -hmm. some of the risks that, that uh, Jacob was yeah. talking about. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's quite a, a shopping list of things that need to be done. And, and, yeah. just, and it's urgent, right? It, yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, Jacob, maybe I could bring you in here because do you, do you think these challenges that currently face financial institutions, financial sector in general, can, can actually be overcome with you know, the provision of new tools, new data, new approaches? What, what do you think could actually lead to these, uh, these fundamental changes required? So, I mean, the one thing is obviously to make yeah. sure that any of the evolutions is centered on the actionability, right? And mm. that's where you have, it's great if you have a number, but if you can't action the number, and Ian, you highlighted data. So one of the things that we're doing with the Bundesbank, for example, is developing an SME data set for the German SME sector, over 350,000 SMEs in the data set now. And so that's an exercise where then if you run an exercise, we can debate TPDs, model scenarios, but you know, okay, here's, mm. You know, SMEs, both business, fine, but you can think about how to develop your strategy around SMEs, not just based, well, I'm a local bank in Germany, I'm not going to stop lending to my SMEs locally. Like, that's not a viable, actionable strategy, whatever a stress test says for me, right? Especially in a, in a more diversified banking sector. I think that's the one thing. I think the other thing is what was already said about connecting this to the multiple scenarios, right? I mean, it is, it does seem that we, we need to think about you know, under how many futures am mm. I surviving rather than am I fine yeah. under this future? Mm. Um, and I think in that point, you know, to Chris's point about mm. the level of ambition, sort of Monday morning quarterbacking, which is obviously my favorite thing to do is to sit this American phrase, to sit there and go, yeah, well, I would have done all these things differently. Probably would have done it more or less exactly like you, and probably not as good, right? <laughs> so easy for me to say that now, but I think, you know, some, I used to work in France, and there, you know, there's, this, there's this sort of a saying there, you used to say, oh, this is a lovely Prosecco, but a horrible champagne, right? <laughs> so I think this is one way to think about this, right? This is a great Prosecco, it's a poor champagne. And if you want to get to this overcoming these challenges, you need quality champagne. So you need SME data at bulk. I think the German Bundesbank is really pioneering this field. You need an integrated nature, social, and climate risk, which is really a stress test then. And to call it that, and have the courage to call it that. Mm. And if you're thinking about five-year scenarios, you're not going to be in the spirit of the uh, op-ed from Financial Times you quoted. You're going to be in a situation where you say, well, we have an El Nino event coming up now, obviously. Mm. So the next couple of years are going to be pretty hot. So what does happen if we're looking at maybe uninhabitability in parts of the tropic, tropics affecting maybe upwards of 50 to 100 million people? Like that's what we should be asking ourselves if we want to run a stress test, because that is what the frontier of climate science tells us is the frontier of our climate risk. 
And that feels uncomfortable because, first of all, the IPCC feels very uncomfortable talking about this. They don't do it properly. You're basically asking people to believe in what most people think is science fiction. And so this is not a comfortable place for the Bank of England to find themselves in. But if you are a bank internally and you are serious about thinking about mm -hmm. these risks, thinking about integrated nature and social risk, I mean, the Irish Troubles here in the UK, they're 10% shock of Northern Ireland GDP. The Irish Troubles have a bigger GDP impact, the historical, empirical Irish Troubles impact, right, from a range of studies, than what most of the IPC studies say about climate change. So why are we not looking at these kind of impacts as part of the climate change, not instead of, but as part of the climate mm -hmm. change, change discourse. And I think that's when we get to the point where we can talk about, yeah. I mean, basically start drinking champagne, right? Which is why yeah. we're here, I understand. Yeah, I'm sure we are. <laughs> and we'd all love to be drinking champagne right now. But, um, unfortunately, we're, we're talking about uh, stress testing the scenarios. So, <laughs> Which um, is like drinking champagne, <laughs> I think. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just wondering, I mean, we, we're having, we can slip into quite a technical discussion here about stress testing, modeling, probabilities, you know, whatever. Uh, from, from a layman's perspective, from, from the person on the street, um, trying to understand all this and, and realize, well, are, are they at risk? Are their savings at risk in the future? I mean, Chris, just you know, looking at it from, a, from that perspective, do you think there's, there's more that can be done uh, in the future, um, moving on from where we are now to try and get these messages across in terms of what, how exposed we are to risk from a financial perspective? So this, this goes to the multiple yeah. roles of the Bank of England. Um, so we've got many different remits, but in, you know, to summarise them, we've got the microprudential remit, looking at the health of the banks and insurers, which speaks to the, the security yeah. of savings in banks. We've got a financial stability remit, which talks about the financial you know, stability of the system. And we've got a monetary policy remit, which people will be familiar with. I think, I think the point that Jane made is a really, really good one, that we talk about scenario analysis as if it's one size fits all, one exercise that yeah. can speak to each of those different remits and a number of different objectives. But unfortunately, that's just not the case. So the, the exercise that we did that we did as part of the CBES, it was a 30-year exercise to look at the vulnerabilities over time. Um, so we kind, of, we, we kind of spoke to the question of the, how you know, secure your savings would be. But actually, if you wanted to do a microprudential test, focusing on that specific question for banks and insurers, what you might want to do is a shorter term, much more stressed exercise that's more akin to the solvency exercises that we do. If you want to look at financial stability as the UK travels to net zero and how that might evolve, then maybe you'd want to do another 30-year exercise. So, so what this points to is the need for a number of different scenario exercises in an ideal world. You'd have a number of different scenarios of different levels of, of um, stress that would allow that to be undertaken and a number of different frameworks. The reality is that we cannot do all of those exercises. That is just too, there's not enough bandwidth to do it. So what we need to do is we need to prioritize and understand where do we want to put our focus? What is the most important thing for us to be looking at at the moment? Yeah. Where, what is, the, what is the, uh, the proximity of the risks to where we are today? To your point on and where are the, our savings or where the yeah. financial stability risks most acute? And that is a discussion that we are having within the Bank of England. It's a discussion that international central banks are having yeah. as we think about how do we build up the toolkits? How do we prioritize um, the work that we're doing? But at the same time, uh, it's not all about the scenario exercises that we're doing, of course it's not. It's also about the work that we're asking firms to do. Yeah. So we're asking banks and insurers to understand internally the risks that they're, they're held to. And I think a really, a really important point to understand if you, if you look at banks is that on their own, they can't understand how their risks are gonna arise over the next five, 10, 15, 20 years. They need to speak to their counterparties, usually in the real economy, um, to understand how they think their risks are, are going to arise. And, and this comes to your point, Rama, that actually you know, a, a bank cannot, it can form a judgment over how one firm might seek to transition over, the, over the, the next 10, 20 years, but they need to speak to that counterparty. They need to understand how they're thinking about it. And actually that was, to my mind, one of the, the greatest successes of the CBES, we, we asked institutions to speak to their 100 largest counterparties, 100 counterparties. In the vast majority of those cases, those discussions had never been had before, and the counterparty were like, we don't know, we've never thought about this. So it triggered those discussions, it triggered a, a, a process where they would have to think about those risks, 
And I think that has to be magnified a number of different times over the next, over the next years right. for us to truly have an understanding of how risks not only happen in the real economy, how they get magnified within the banks and insurers and what that means for, for us. So it's, it's very complex. Right. I'm going to open it up to questions in a minute. Um, did you want to come in with a point, Jake? Yeah, just, I just wanted to add because I was yeah. struck by the use of the word savings here. Yeah. I think it's quite an interesting discussion that we always think about the risk to savings, yeah. but not the risk to levels of savings, a.k.a. Mm. wealth. Mm. And it is just a missing piece of the climate puzzle. There are no models that I'm aware of, and I've talked to dozens of modelers on this topic, that measure the impact of climate change on wealth. And we're not just talking capital stock and as input into the production process, we're talking a country's wealth. Germany re recovered its GDP level in the late 1950s after World War II, still hasn't recovered its wealth levels from World War II, 70 years later. And that's, I think, a an, an really interesting part of thinking about savings and centering that as part of the different use cases you described, Chris. Yeah. Mm. I'd just Brian. like to make a comment about what uh, mm. uh, said. So I think uh, this, it's very important to note that the, this exercise was conducted by the Bank of England because it's the only institution in, in the UK which could have done this. Uh, because unlike uh, stress testing done by financial institutions for their short-term exposures to market risk and credit risk, uh, any given financial institution does not have the visibility uh, on the elements that are needed, the inputs that are needed to conduct such an exercise. It's only, you need a broad cross-sectional view on many things that are not available to the financial institution itself. And I would argue that uh, actually for a realistic assessment of one of the points that was brought up, the short-term impact of uh, long-term risk or climate risk, uh, you, you also need uh, to broaden beyond the banking sector because most of the assets in the economy are held by asset managers that are not banks, insurance companies, pension funds, other asset managers. And uh, we speak about transition risk as some kind of abstract um, mechanism whereby climate risk will affect financial markets. But in fact, it's very concrete. It's the rebalancing uh, policy of these large asset managers, which will determine capital flows from one sector to another, divestment or investment in new sectors and so on. This will determine how markets will react in the short term or the medium term to the, uh, to the specter of long-term climate metrics. So I think including the behavior of these large asset managers in the model, and in a model which can only be a macro model run by the Bank of England, that can give a concrete meaning to, a way, concrete way to model what transition risk is concretely and how it will impact financial institutions. I'm going to bring Ian in here. Yeah. Okay. Just before we um, yeah. it, was, it was two small things. One of the findings we had in the report, which was really interesting, and it wasn't actually one of those objectives of the exercise, was people were saying they didn't have enough time to talk to their counterparties. So actually, it was a really positive thing because go and talk to your biggest hundred. Well, we've never done that before, and it was like we now actually would have wished to have had more time so we could have engaged in that more fully. So I think that was really important in terms of something that came out of it. I think the other thing was something Joe said, which was this was just large banks and insurers. These are the banks that have the most resource and the most capacity to do this, and they're constrained. So once we go outside of that pool and we then start to go into smaller banks or smaller insurers, that constraint is going to become much, much more binding. And so a lot of the heavy lifting being done by large banks is going to hopefully allow us to sort of develop capacity further down the market because the, other, the resource constraint is human capital and there's not enough of it for the large global banks, large global insurers. It's definitely not going to be there further down the chain. So that gap has to be filled and it has to be filled quickly. Chris, and I'll, I'm going to ask uh, questions just after Chris's comment here. So, one down there. Yeah, so, so I'll just make one quick comment. And, and I'm paid to be a bit cynical and, 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 and focus on risk. But when I hear that banks and insurers said they didn't have enough time to speak to their counterparties, I'm, I'm dubious about that. They had two years, potentially two and a half years, yeah. from the point they were told they'd have to do it to the point they had to submit. Now, I don't know how long it takes to pick up a phone to a counterparty and have a meaningful discussion with them, but I suspect it's somewhat less than that. So I think what this tells us is that in a lot of cases, it's really important that there's a catalyst for that discussion to have to happen. 
So you could take you could take this as an indication that the discussion might not even have happened now had we not run the exercise. So so I yeah, it'd be interesting to get underneath yeah. that one. Question over here. Thanks. Yeah, hi. Um, I guess you say who you are as well, please. Uh, Scott Agge. I, I guess that as an economist, I can say I don't think William Nordhaus won a Nobel Prize for climate stress testing, <laughs> uh, for sure. Yet there's a methodology that's been carried throughout from the top down IAM side. I don't want to get into those details. Just a simple question for the whole panel. If the current scenarios don't really reflect risk because they are trend changes in macro factors over 30 years, and risk credit specifically is easily observed over the last 30 years with three systematic recessions that are driven by unexpected shocks, that's risk. So is it not true that the next step for climate stress testing and scenario generation is to add risk? Hmm, good point. Because there is no risk now. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah no, I completely, Do you wanna, yeah, no, Jen, I completely agree. The, the interest scenarios are, sorry. No, no you go ahead. Um, they're smooth and they don't have the volatility that's required, absolutely. And, in fact, I would say we've concentrated so much on 1.5 degree pathways, two degree pathways, we should be looking at three and four degree pathways pro properly, okay. not um, you know, incorporating the full range of, of what we can expect, which will be, unfortunately, you know, migration, conflict, the whole thing. It's not going to be 4% drop in GDP by the end, um, whatever William Norhouse thought, it's going to be much, much worse than that. And just one sentence to add, and if we don't do that, I think we should stop. If we're not ready to really do the stress test exercise, and let's stay with the capacity building and the education and the looking at things like this, but if, unless we start doing that, we, I don't think there's a point to continue. Chris? And I, you, you could turn the question around and say, okay, well, if, if, if there isn't any risk included in the scenarios, then still look at the level of impairments that come through. I mean, for, for a scenario that doesn't include risk, there's a lot going on in the economy. I mean, there's hundreds of billions worth of write downs. That's before you include trade, trading with scenarios. And that's if you assume they're spread over 30 years, but they'll be concentrated in certain sectors in certain regions. So I think, um, I, don't, I don't disagree that the scenarios could be more risky. Of course, of course they could, but for a non-risky scenario, if that's the case, the numbers that are coming out in the back of it are quite, are, are quite, um, are quite notable. Not in the ECB approach, though. Yeah, there's a question over there, in the middle, thank you. Hi, thank you. Uh, Carolina Basta, PhD student from Oxford. So I have a question relating to the previous one, which is how do we include this risk? Like Rama was talking about the fact that we're currently just centering these scenarios. How do we get the volatility to have the whole ensemble of scenarios? So that's one question. And the second, how do we move from reporting, which is currently done, to enforcing actual action hmm. at the part of the financial institutions? Hmm. Thank you. So how do we include the risk and how do we actually lead to action from reporting? Maybe, Well, um, I think building on what I said previously is, I think that the, uh, there are two, uh, two really sources of risk in such a type of model. One is exogenous risk, for example, physical uh, climate risk. Uh, but I think the driver of the uh, main driver of risk in the short term, which is what really focuses the attention of financial institutions, is here the reaction of the financial institutions themselves to the announcement of this climate risk uh, at um, some long horizon. So the, the rebalancing of portfolios, which will cause impact on uh, an impact on the financial markets in the short and medium term. And that needs to be modeled in some way in order to make these models realistic. Otherwise, uh, we don't have... So there is this external volatility, of course. You can always input market volatility into such, such a model. But I, I think even greater impact will come from the re rebalancing of portfolios and the shift of investment strategies in the short and medium term. Mm -hmm. So I think that's uh, one of the things that we should yeah. try to understand. And that's exactly what transition risk is about. All right. What about the um, leading to action? Anybody want to take that part of the question? I, 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 I can, I can say that. I, 
So, so we are taking action already. We've got mm. supervisory regulatory expectations on, on the banks and insurers that this nests into. So we set those in 2019. We said that all of the banks and insurers across the UK have to be doing um, scenario analysis to inform their risk processes. So we're rolling those out at the moment. All firms had to have that in place to some degree with appropriate ambition um, at, the beginning of, at the beginning of last year. So we see these steps as being absolutely complementary. I, I can speak about that for a long time and get very boring about it, so I won't. But, um, but, don't. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but we see that as the absolute linchpin of how we actually enforce an understanding of risk and yeah. the embedding of scenario analysis. There's a question out there at the back, I think. Thanks. Um, Tom Philp from Maximum Information. Um, this has been a really great panel, actually, and I've really appreciated the diversity of the opinions and voices on it. Um, I don't think I've heard an answer, though, to the question, what's next after CBES? Um, I think I'd pose that directly at you, Chris, and Nicola, if she was here, but maybe Ian to represent that. Um, yeah, there's a lot of us in the market looking at what's next, what comes, how to respond, and how to pre-plan, I guess, for what's going to happen. Um, are there any plans in place? Yeah. Chris, what's coming next? I think it's the question. So, um, so we've, said, we've said publicly uh, that um, what we want to do is to ensure that there is a period where firms can embed the significant learnings that they need to undertake from the previous CBES. If we, if we ran the exercise every single year, we just see very similar results every year. So, so what we need to think about is what is the appropriate frequency for a climate exercise to what does the climate exercise look like? Does it look exactly like the CBES with the same objectives? Do you look to focus in on some of the other aspects that we've talked about, you know, shorter term trade, trade in books? All of these, all these questions need to be um, considered. Um, and I think the third point is um, uh, at, at the point that we do it, how does it nest into all of the other aspects that firms are being expected to do? Bit transition plans, bit regulatory uh, principles, those, those, kind of, those kind of things. So, um, I guess my overall answer to that is watch the space. Right, there's a question from this side of the room. Okay. Hi, um, Albertine from Columbia Threat Needle Asset Management. Um, my question really goes to kind of circularity of risk here. So one of the things that was mentioned by Rama is getting the asset managers allocation into the models, for example. Um, but also at the same time that our current scenario analysis aren't really accounting for risk. So what is the risk of putting scenario analysis results from insurers and banks into the market which aren't risky enough in terms of asset managers being able to understand the risk? It's kind of circular because you look yeah. at the risks, they don't look bad, but then they're not actually considering the things um, yeah. Jakob is talking about, which is conflict, drag, yeah. etc. Yeah, that's a fair point. False illusion. Anybody want to address that? I, I, I think it's a great point, actually, and there, is, there was a danger um, from the regulatory stress test that they haven't been stressful, particularly, and people are going, oh, what's the problem? Um, and that kind of plays to your point, Jacob, that don't bother if it's going to be like that. We need to actually ramp up the stress. Um, so I think I completely agree with you. And the other thing, if I can make just two, two other points, there is a danger that uh, the financial system now is kind of really moving towards just using the NGFS scenarios. So we've seen it in our own surveys. And the problem is if those, if those scenarios aren't risky enough, they're not extreme enough, then we're going to be complacent. Uh, so, so we absolutely need to introduce riskier, uh, more volatile scenarios. Um, so I completely agree with that. The other thing, which is a slightly different point, but we talk a lot about reporting as if it's going to save the world. And um, it's not. It won't. It won't. Oh, it won't. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to tell you that. Oh, um, uh -huh. I and know. And makes things Santa Claus isn't real. <laughs> <laughs> um, the thing is, um, reporting's great, you know, and, and there's a process of putting together a TCFD report, transition plan, which is incredibly beneficial, but let's not pretend the reporting is going to save the world or save humanity. It's, it's absolutely not. What we need is we need robust policy, okay? And we need to get on with this as soon as possible because the more we delay, the more abrupt the transition will be and the more disorderly and the more risky and the more costly. Um, I've talked to people who are putting together TCFD plans. They get their lawyers to go through them. They look at anything that's uh, 
remotely uh, risky or uh, market moving, whatever, they, they just strip it out. The lawyers just get there. So, so my question is, you know, how much value is there in the scenario analysis that we're seeing published? Mm. I don't know, but I don't think that these reporting frameworks are necessarily, they're, they're part of it, but they're absolutely not going to solve the whole problem. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Briefly? Yeah, so, and I think just to be clear, right, because, because of the yeah. language we use, the point isn't necessary to make them more risky per se, right? This isn't, oh, we don't see enough risk, so let's add in some risk until we get the, this isn't sort of a data yeah. mining exercise, it's to reflect the risk better. I think this is the important message. I had a, a sort of the, you know, 1.2 billion potential climate refugees by 2050. There's not a single economic model in the IPCC that tells us what might happen economically in this scenario, which exists in some academic research studies. This is the key. It's reflecting the risk properly, not mining the numbers in order to give it the risk that we'd like to see. Because to be honest, it's great if we don't have a lot of risk at the end of the day, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's just not great if it's because we do an incomplete exercise. Yeah. This gentleman's here has been dying to ask a question, so Thank you've you. got the last Thank word. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> the question I'm going to answer is, what's death after CBES? I'm going to encourage Jakob, in the scenario work we are doing, El Nino figures. It is quite like the 1998-1999 one will be exceeded. In the scenario work we are doing, La Nina follows it. The pension fund is looking at the real world. Sorry, Mike Clark, our advisor. Yep, so we know who you are. <laughs> so they are taking the real world. There are no numbers. Let me say that again. There are no numbers. Now, uh, looking at the real world, I disagree with the quotation of the Italian economist that you presented. If you were a board before climate scenarios came along, did you get modelling to make strategic decisions around the board table? No. You thought about the future, to Joe's point. You thought about the future, where you could <coughs> numerically deal with risk, mm -hmm. you might have considered it, but you thought about the world you were heading to. Mm -hmm. The financial sector has sadly entered the world of financial economists who are seeking to model something that is probably not modelable, often, Trump reelected, mass migration. What's your question, sorry? The question is, do the panel believe that a large, greater proportion of narrative scenarios are what comes after? CBEST was good, CBEST scenarios are very poor for decision making, so the question is, do we need more narratives? Do we need more narratives? Yes. Yes. So, yes. So first, let me say I agree with uh, the, the, your, your, your disagreement with the Italian economist quoted in the FT. We absolutely do not need prob assigning probabilities to scenarios to do risk analysis. In fact, the whole uh, hmm. methodology of stress testing is you have some stress scenarios, you look at your exposure to the stress scenario. You don't need to have a probability. And often it is impossible to come up with plausible or realistic probabilities associated with any of the SSP scenarios and even less if you start uh, adding uh, uh, market variables. So we don't need probabilities. So uh, do we need uh, more realistic stress scenarios? I think that's what was said in the panel. Yeah, we do need. I think you can see CBS as a useful uh, first step to, for capacity building. Basically, the idea is if financial institutions are, have the technology and the, and the channels to assess their exposure to the CBES scenarios, they can also use the same technology and channels to assess mm. their exposure to other hypothetical scenarios, which we may come up with later if we're more imaginative. So that, in that sense, it's useful. Is it a stress testing exercise? As we said, as Joe and I said in the beginning, we think no, it's not a stress testing exercise, it's just a scenario analysis exercise, which is useful to have. Uh, and I, let me repeat what I said in the beginning. Unlike um, current stress tests conducted in some financial institutions where you have some idea where the risk lies because you're long equity, so the index falls is a good stress scenario. Here, we don't really know exactly where the risk lies. There are many, many factors influencing each other in this, yeah. uh, in this universe. So we need to consider a very broad range of scenarios and then ex post, the output of the exercise will tell us which scenarios are risky 
provided we have modeled them realistically and all the things inside. So this, it's very important to consider a broad range of scenarios. Otherwise, any, we cannot any have a realistic. Any final words? Yes, Jacob. So I, I think it's, I wouldn't call it either or, but we definitely need to do better at narrative. Just one example, I think, is inevitable policy response scenarios, which now have dedicated narratives that don't try and put a number on everything, but tell the storyline of the transition together with the scenarios. Mm -hmm. But I, I wouldn't give up on the financial side just to suggest because we haven't really tried to integrate social nature risk into these stories yet. So we might as well give it a go. But we need more narrative conversations for sure. And IPR, I think, is a good example to point to here. Chris. And my, my final point, I, I agree. We, we need more narratives. We need um, more choices of scenarios. I guess the one thing we need to balance, though, is um, we need to have some form of comparing scenarios across institutions. As, as we know, it's at some point, you know, firms can make anything happen with a scenario because often it's what's under, under the top level narrative where um, key mm -hmm. modelling decisions happen. So we need to make sure that people understand what they see is being modelled when they see the results coming out. But absolutely agree. We need a, a bigger suite of narratives yeah. and scenarios. Okay, thanks, Chris. I think we're going to stop there. Uh, we could carry on forever, but we'd rather not. Um, I think one thing I've learned is that we need champagne as well as Prosecco <laughs> and that Santa Claus really doesn't exist, sorry to tell you that. So thank you very much for your questions, I've uh, been an excellent panel. I uh, did need to thank everybody for uh, excellent contributions. Uh, it's, it's now lunch time everybody, so just to let you know the keynote at 2.15 will also be streamed live in the Jeffrey Mitchell Theatre which is down two floors. So thanks again to the panel and enjoy your lunch.